Welcome to the latest Rebel Wisdom podcast. This is a slightly different concept. So last week I interviewed Jordan Peterson again uh, for the second time and I asked him a few questions about the relationship with the left and he gave a few answers that I'd never heard before and we're going to play some of that in this podcast. And off the back of that, um, we, we've also just come back from America and we recorded this amazing discussion with some guys from the California Institute of Integral Studies mm. on exactly the same topic, what can the left learn from Jordan Peterson. So we decided to bring out a whole, do a few more interviews on the same subject and bring out about six or seven interviews at the same time. So if you're watching this, the link to all of those interviews should be below this in the show notes and we're going to play some clips from those during this during this podcast mm. because it feels to me like we're trying with rebel wisdom to really follow the cultural conversation really kind of identify where the cultural conversation is going and it seems to me that for quite a while on the left in particular they were kind of waiting for Jordan Peterson to go away like anyone who has that kind of exponential curve usually explodes and goes away um, he doesn't seem to be. I actually asked him that question at the beginning of the interview. Um, and his theory is that this is actually a switch over from different forms of media, from broadcast media where they get tired of you and they spit you out, to mm. online media where that narrative no longer holds, mm. um, which is interesting in itself. And we'll put up that sometime soon. I don't want to f get dragged into politics mm. too much. We've basically done lots of stuff so far about different subjects, spirituality, psychedelics. Um, our sense is that like the, the idea of rebel wisdom is that what we're seeing is a, is a change in paradigms, a change in worldviews, and we're sort of trying to kind of identify what that is. So politics is just a subset of this kind of wider shift that we're seeing going on. And I think for me, it's really important that we don't get dragged down into the political level too much, but I think this is what's been coming up mm so far, so we're doing one big foray into the political space. Yeah. Um, as you were saying that, it reminded me of something actually either Jesse or Matt said from CIS, the CIS talk, um, which will be released at the same time as this, which was around, it's much more interesting to talk about the underlying symptoms, uh, so the underlying structure than the symptoms, and politics for me feels very much like the symptom of an underlying issue. It's for me in many ways the least interesting thing to talk about. Um, not least because we know or have pretty good evidence to suggest that your, your own temperament, you know, um, how you balance the big five personality traits, etc., has a huge influence in your politics, as does your personal history. So, so in a sense, while it is important and interesting, I think it's, it's almost, it's the tip of the iceberg. And, and I personally am also much more interested in the, the rest of the iceberg. Another thing as well, which is worth mentioning, is that I think we both started talking maybe just quite recently a couple of weeks ago about is there a shift happening within the left now because a couple of things came out at the same time there was a paper from um a pretty well-known activist here um i'm not sure if you remember his uh, i think that's it yeah mentioning how he'd been putting on conferences and and they had been taken over by the kind of what, what i would call the the social justice kind of identity politics mm. fundamentalism and it had, you know, this is someone who genuinely cares about making systems change. And he had started noticing, well, we're not getting anywhere. It's just, you know, it's been taken over. So that was interesting. And then Obama criticized uh, the, the shortcomings of identity politics. And ABC put it out and there was a tweet that... Something about it's not who you are that should decide whether you get to speak or not. Precisely, yeah. And, and he used a really nice example of um, when Nelson Mandela was in prison and what he didn't do was kind of um, polarise into one thing and get sucked into hate. Yeah, and I think it's also worth mentioning that all of these words are kind of labels. Like, we, we talk a lot about integral theory, for example, the idea that even left, we're sort of in a position now where we're kind of going beyond left or right. Yeah. Um, and I think that's very true, and it's really important to, to say that you can talk about the word left, you can talk about the word liberal, you can talk about the word progressive. They tend, there are personality types that underpin the sort of the idea of left and right, sort of more, one more open than, than closed, one more ordered than the other. I mean, these, these are, do exist, but there's always a sort of fluidity when we're talking about this. So it's not that, um, I think a, 
especially if you've been in this sort of space for a while, you kind of maybe even flinch at the idea of people using the words left and right yeah. because you kind of, well, we're, we're so beyond all of these labels. And it's like, well, we are, but they are actually pointing to real temperamental differences. Yeah. And there are habits of thought on what you might call the left, mm. which are, um, yeah, which, which are, are shared by most people who would, who would share those kind of personality characteristics and share those kind of, that, that kind of worldview. Yeah. Um, so we can use the word meaningfully, I think, yeah. while holding it quite lightly at the same time. So without further ado, we're going to play the first clip of the interview with Jordan Peterson. Eric Weinstein described sort of the, the cultural moment as a kind of civil war within the left. Um, I, I'm, I've got a lot of progressive friends and what I see happening recently, maybe in the last couple of weeks, is a lot of them starting to grapple with your ideas um, and looking at, asking this question, what can the left learn from Jordan Peterson? Um, which is, a, which is a, a pretty new development because um, I saw a lot of kind of reactivity to it before. How can you personally contribute to that debate? And is, oh, that, well, is that a debate you're interested in? Oh, to? absolutely. No, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Um, what one thing that I've been doing in my tour repeatedly when I talk about the first chapter of my book, which is stand up straight with your shoulders back, it's a discussion of hierarchies and, and their eternal nature, right? Because my claim is, and it's not my claim, I think it's mere fact that organisms that have to cooperate and compete uh, with other organisms of their type inevitably arrange themselves into hierarchies. And that's been going on for so long, which, uh, which is at least 300 million years, that our nervous systems have adapted to hierarchies as if they're a permanent element of being, right? More permanent than trees, like seriously permanent. The most fundamental neurochemical, the one that regulates the entire brain, serotonin, is acutely sensitive to hierarchical distinctions. And so that's part of the proposition. So the reason I laid that proposition forward was to say, whatever pitfalls hierarchies might produce, you cannot lay them at the feet of the West, patriarchy, or capitalism. It's like, that's a non-starter. You're wrong. And not just a little bit wrong. You're so seriously wrong that if you insist upon doing that, you won't even achieve your own aims. Because you're actually not grappling with the problem. The problem is, if hierarchies are a problem, which they are, the problem is way more serious than mere capitalism. It's way deeper. And if you're actually interested in rectifying the, cons the, the negative consequences of hierarchies, then you're going to have to get a lot more sophisticated than, their, than your idiot Marxism. So, so, so part of the elaboration of that argument is, well, hierarchies are inevitable because we have to solve complex problems and we have to solve them socially. And when you implement a solution to a complex problem socially, you produce a hierarchy because some people are better at the implementation than others. So there's a hierarchy of competence and then there's a hierarchy of distribution of the spoils. And so and in both of those hierarchies, you get a disproportionate clumping of resources at the top and dispossession at the bottom. It's in the nature of hierarchies. So what's the left for? The left is to remind those who are benefiting from the hierarchies that the hierarchy comes at a cost. And the cost is the clumping of people at the bottom. And that that's an eternal cost and it's not trivial. And so that's what the left should be properly focused on. The left should be providing the voice of those who are dispossessed by hierarchies. And the right should be saying, yeah, but the damn hierarchies are necessary. And they're not only necessary, but they're also productive. Then the left says, yes, but they tilt towards tyranny and they can be occupied inappropriately by people who are playing games of power. Fair enough, the right has to take that into account. The hierarchy can rigid rigidify and is likely to do that and it can be taken over by people who are corrupt and that's likely to happen. And so, but, but it's okay because the dialogue can work out. The, the, the right can say, well, yeah, we need the damn hierarchies and they need to be buttressed and the left can say, Yes, but they have to be maintained properly so they don't deteriorate and degenerate. 
And, and I, think that's, I think that's ancient wisdom. I think the ancient Egyptians had figured that out in their symbolic representations. So now, when the left goes too far, it does something like say, well, how about no hierarchies? It's like, no, how about not? Wrong. Because all that happens if you flatten, one of the things that happens if you flatten out the hierarchy is that you can't even organize your perceptions. You can't perceive the world without looking at the world through a hierarchy of value. And if, because you can't perceive the world unless you make one thing more important than all the other things, because you don't even know what to look at. And if one thing isn't more important than all the other things, then you have nothing to aim at. If you have nothing to aim at, then you have no meaning in your life. So the left can't just demolish the hierarchies in the name of some equality of outcome, let's say, because you blow out the future, you leave people aimless, and you destroy the very institutions that allow people to make competent progress in the world. That's not an acceptable outcome. So we have to, we have to agree to live with the tension. Necessity for hierarchies, the proclivity for them to pathologize, and the, the necessary voice of the left in speaking for the, for the dispossessed. So, and I mean, I've, as far as I'm concerned, I've said something approximating that through my entire career. And so the fact that the left-wingers have been irritated at me is, well, in some sense, that's an inevitable consequence of me taking on the radical left-wingers, but it's also the refusal by the moderate left to deal with their internal problems. Yeah, so the first question I asked was whether he actually wants to be part of that conversation, like the conversation with the internal conversation, which as Eric Weinstein said, it feels like what's going on is a civil war within the left. Mm. And it's sort of the mainstream left that's now become the cult, that was the counterculture and has now become the mainstream culture. How does the left draw boundaries? Because the left by, by its nature does not like boundaries. So the issue is, how does the left draw boundaries around internal boundaries that say, well, actually you're trying to hijack the conversation. You have an ideological agenda or whatever. It's like, how can you have a generative dialogue when you can't build boundaries of people who are not willing to acknowledge the, the, the things that are required to have a generative dialogue. That for me is the sort of the, the, the best way of describing what's going on in the left. And I, I have got the sense with Jordan Peterson, part of this is kind of optics. He's been on Fox News a lot and he, he was also on, I think, Rebel Media, um, very different from Rebel Wisdom. Um, and the sense that he, because it's such a polarizing and volatile moment has been pulled onto one side of the culture wars. Like the right has embraced him, the left has kind of rejected him. So I think by definition, he's seen on one side more than the other. Personally, I don't actually think that he, I don't think his natural home is there. And I think if people sort of were able to get past some of their reactivity to him, they'd see that that's not his natural home. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. I think there's something around as you were saying that, I was wondering, like, could he have been picked up by the more left-leaning ones? And I think because of that mm. ideological blindness in the culture, it, within many parts of the left, I think it would have been so difficult for him, for them to, they couldn't, they can't hold that complexity. I think a few people have written articles recently about how the right uh, was able to draw boundaries because of the horrors of World War II and the horrors of seeing really what happens when fascism, you know, uh, gets, gets into a position of power. And there's a weird thing on the left. You see it with Corbyn, you see it with a lot of the kind of old school left. And, and you know, this, um, the young woman who was on Piers Morgan and said, I'm literally a communist, you know, Ash Sarkar, I think. Yeah. That was just a few days ago. And um, Douglas Murray wrote a really good piece, actually, in The Spectator around the insanity of that, of like, the right knows how bad it gets when the right goes extreme. The left should know. Like, and I mean, it's clear, it's in the history books we, we know, it was even more recent um, and happened over and over again in many different countries. And I think there's, there's that element at play as well. And Jordan Peterson talks about that a lot. You know, he talks about the, the horrors of, of yeah. collective. And how the left, how the, the sort of pathology on the left is not necessarily one single idea, like on the right, it's kind of racial superiority, or right, you're no longer in the conversation. Mm -hmm. On the left, it's sort of a, a, it's a combination of maybe three good values. Yeah. But I think the central one is that fairness is a good value, but if you make fairness your kind of primary axiom, mm -hmm. 
it ends up leading to madness. And that's another Eric Weinstein uh, quote. He says that if you build um, a cosmology on a narrative of oppression, it leads to madness. Because as Jordan Peterson said in the interview with me, if depending on where you draw the line, everyone is an oppressor and everyone is oppressed yeah. on some level. Um, the, the interesting thing as well for me about the left is this sort of, you talk about the mask of compassion, mm. but just this assumption of moral good on the left. And I think Peterson has been the, the victim of that. This assumption that all, all the moral value is on the left and on people who think in the same way as people on the left think. And I'm struck by, there, there was one piece in one of his podcasts, sorry, one of his lectures where he describes helping one of his patients as a psychologist um, with, he, he got him a job in a charity folding letters and found, the guy found it really, really difficult. Like it was really hard to do. But the narrative that comes through is that he was with this guy for like 10 hours and supported him for many years. And it's, that's what I find really difficult when people, it's clear that this is someone who cares deeply about people and has been deeply involved in people's lives, helping people. So this assumption of the left of, well, he must be a monster or he must be a fraud or all of this stuff is really, it's difficult to take for anyone who's kind of delved into his lectures and understands the kind of guy that he is. Yeah, not surprising for me, having not really been on the left since I was maybe 18 and having been more on the kind of, um, yeah, certainly more towards the right, maybe more anarchistic and libertarian at different times. But there is an assumption generally of exactly what you said, that all the moral virtues on the left, which is uh, not true when you actually engage with, with um, thought that comes from the right. Especially if you think about, so Franz de Waal, Dutch biologist, has done many experiments around uh, empathy in animals, in, in mammals. Um, and pretty conclusively shown that fairness is something that's built into us. We all have a sense of what's fair. It's so deeply built in that if you get two dogs to do the same trick and give one of them a treat and not the other one, the other dog will stop doing that trick. Um, and capuchin monkeys, I mean, it's deeply ingrained. So to assume that one side of the political spectrum somehow has it and the other side don't have this biologically encoded sense of it is absurd because everyone cares about fairness on either side of the political spectrum. It's just that they have a different interpretation of what's fair and what isn't. I think this is a really good time to play a clip from the CIIS mm -hmm. debate. Uh, Jesse Estrin, who, a uh, lovely guy who works in prisons, like he's been deeply involved in social justice work for a lot of his life. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'll play the clip now and you'll see, you'll see what he says. I've grown up and I've been really involved in um, social justice issues, racial justice, gender justice, involved with um, philanthropy and activism on, on a lot of different levels actually. Um, and that's how I was raised. So I've really been in this space my whole life. And this is the first time I've actually been encountering other viewpoints that would be either more center, more conservative. And I'm actually really, it's feeling really fruitful. It's really refreshing, it's really stimulating my thinking. It's hard to see other people not join me in that and get kind of weirded out or freaked out by it, which then makes me even more intrigued. So yeah, that's a clip from one of the pieces that we've, we've just put live. So it's a four-way debate that we had with uh, Jesse Estrin and Matthew Seagal after they, so they come from a very sort of liberal, left-leaning college called the California Institute of Integral Studies but were really engaged. They put out this podcast where they started asking what the left could learn from Jordan Peterson and what the reactivity on the left to him said. And a few of the other things that we explore in there is why the quality of the rejection by the left is so extreme that there must be something else going on. What Jesse says, it's, it's like a psychological com complex almost. Yeah. It's, too, it's, it's out of kilter with, with what's actually going on. And whenever something like that happens, you have to kind of unpack it and try and understand why people are having such reactivity or such kind of strong responses to it. Yeah, I thought that was a real, I really enjoyed every moment of that conversation. Really smart, um, embodied guys. And it goes, it, yeah, it's really good flow to the, the whole time, exploring the ideas with a lot of mutual respect and um, yeah, watch it, it's good. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that we looked at and we thought, okay, so there is this, there's definitely something happening where people on the left are starting to ask what Jordan Peterson has to offer. And one of those was our friend Ronan Harrington put out this film for his channel Alter Ego saying, 
comparing and contrasting Jordan Peterson and Russell Brand. And in his sort of circles, even kind of validating Jordan Peterson and saying, well, he might have something to offer, uh, provoked some kind of reaction in some of the people that, that, that watched the video. But, and we had a, a really great chat um, where he agrees with Jordan Peterson, where he disagrees. But I think his, his central point about the criticism was really, really good. In a way, the video was about Jordan Peterson's thinking, but it, on a more meta level, it was a commentary on our political culture. So we face this um, enormous pressure to either love or hate either public figures or issues, or to endorse them and to reject them, and to be very public in that. Um, but people and issues are really complex, and with someone like Jordan Peterson, I can see lots of, as I said in the video, profound contributions and strengths, and also areas where I feel like his thinking is really off. And how can you hold that complexity in a tribal, polarized culture where you're kind of shot down for holding it? And I think that that maybe is the new political space is opening up as more and more people willing to go like, no, I'm not going to just fall into a binary. I'm going to try and stay open and hold the complexity. So I think his point that a lot of Jordan Peterson admirers, I, I really don't like the word fan because I think it's a terrible energy, but a lot of Jordan Peterson admirers are really put off by the tone of the criticism of him. Yeah. It's not that we don't like people criti criticizing Jordan Peterson and Jordan Peterson's ideas. Even he himself mm. welcomes and invites people to criticize his ideas. But it's the tone that comes through a lot of the time in the media articles. When you hear someone say he's a fraud or he's a charlatan or any of this stuff, it's like, he's clearly not a fraud or a charlatan. Mm. So as soon as you start using that kind of language and a criticism of him, it's very difficult to take that criticism seriously. Mm. And also, it's very, there's, a, there's such a, an arrogance in some of the critiques that it's like I'm thinking of one in particular it's like okay you're a you're a, you're a journalist in your late 20s you've done what exactly that gives you the 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 knowledge the self-knowledge to be able to kind of pass judgment on someone who has is having whether you like him or not this incredible impact on on people's lives all around the world like what what is going on what is going on at a subconscious level mm. It reminds me of, I mean, there's a couple of answers that I've heard um, from a few people, which is that it's like, okay, that they post an article, it's like, that's actually mischaracterizing his ideas. Here's the lectures where he talks about them. And the response is often, well, I can't have time to watch 20 hours of lectures. And my response, if, if a journalist says that is like, well, then don't write about him, you know? Um, it's, I think that's, I'm just thinking as well of the, unrelated but slightly related the James Damore um, memo that he got fired from Google for that was a similar thing where I don't think a lot of the journalists had actually read the memo so I remember I read the entire thing and then was like what it's not what and then trying to read articles and, and trying to see where they had parsed these things together and it just didn't it didn't gel it's like they hadn't read it and I think there's that sense as well of um, like Criticism is needed and so important. That's how the conversation moves forward. But you can't criticize if you don't engage with the ideas. Like I don't, I wouldn't criticize Freud because I know like a little bit about Freud. I don't know the body of his work. And until I knew like a pretty decent amount, I wouldn't go out there saying Freud is bunk. So we also recorded a, an interview with Tim Lott, who is a novelist and journalist who wrote the first Spectator article about Jordan Peterson. Uh, I think around the same time as I brought out my documentary. Really interesting guy who is described himself as an old lefty. Yeah. So he's kind of was a Guardian columnist and was, yeah, he, he talks about kind of the journey that he's gone on and also the, the danger that he sees in this kind of new ideology yeah. that, and the danger of that impacting art. Because effectively, and he, he puts this really brilliantly, it's like anyone who says I know he's very suspicious of. Mm. The idea that I know and the answer is diversity and equity and everything needs to be seen through this prism mm. is ultimately a totalitarian mindset. Yeah. Like there's not, it's not that these values are wrong. And this is where I keep coming back to, like the, mm. the sophistication. And I, 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 I genuinely would, would like to hear Jordan Peterson making this point a little bit more carefully. Because mm. when, he, when he starts railing against diversity and equity and all these things, 
I can see the kind of react, the reaction that it provokes. Whereas, like as you said before, fairness is a good value. Mm. Diversity is a good value. If you can Im imagine, like certainly police officers in their community should reflect their community. It will help them do their jobs better. There are certain jobs, certainly, where diversity is a, is a positive value. Mm. But if you make that your primary axiom and assume that that's the only way to see the world and the only way to kind of organize your, your, your being in the world, then it becomes extremely dangerous very quickly. Yeah. Um, leads to madness, as we said before. Mm. So we'll play a, a short clip from Tim. Finally and fundamentally, it's the individual that matters. And how could I think anything otherwise as a writer, if any job is about the individual voice, it's the job of the novelist. You know, if, I mean, you know films are collective projects. Writing a novel is the ultimate individual act, the ultimate individual voice. And even that is coming under pressure now. You know, people are, they have, they have um, I think they're called something like they're not called morality readers, but they're, they're something diversity like... Diversity reader? Diversity readers. They have editors now who check, you know, that you don't have any inappropriate... You don't have any inappropriate opinions in your... You know, even for your characters. That's a really deep sickness as far as I'm concerned. That is... That is... Totalitarian thought. And it's totalitarian thought, not in the government, but it's the totalitarian thought mindset that I see on the march. There are a few things in the interview with Jordan Peterson that I've never heard him say before. And the sticking point that I hear a lot from my sort of more progressive friends is your sort of primary focus is on the individual. Yeah, well, that's, that's too bad for them because no, the no, primary no, focus no, should no, be on the individual. No, no, I, I, I can agree with that. What I, what I, the, the paradox that they would say, it's like, okay, focus on the individual but you have to accept that there are some situations that are much more conducive to an individual thriving than other situations. And so their focus is on structural inequality, your focus is on the individual. Is there not some interplay between Oh, those? definitely. Well, obviously, because people do have group identities. The question is whether, whether the group or the individual identity should be paramount. And the leftist answer, the radical leftist answer is, well, there is, the, look, it's not me that's failing to take into account those two levels of analysis. It's the bloody radical leftists, because for them, it's the collective, and that's that. And so it's obvious, as far as I'm concerned, that people have their individuality, and then behind that, they have their, they have their group, I, multiple group identities, which is also a big problem, but conceptually, for the left. Or any of these situations that make it much more difficult for people to self-actualize. Mm -hmm. what, what I think they'd argue is they don't hear you talk about that very much. Well, it isn't. First of all, it's not self-evident. Like I'm not. I don't accept Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I don't think it's necessarily more difficult for people who are poor to self-actualize. Sorry, I don't buy that. You th because what that would mean? Think about what that would mean. That would mean that the rich are morally superior. That's what that means, because they have all the opportunities to self-actualize. So obviously, if the material conditions are the prerequisite for self-actualization, then the rich are morally superior to the poor. Is that really an argument we want to make? And in, in fact, I don't think that that's even, even vaguely reasonable, because one of the things that does help build character is privation. Now, obviously, starving to death is an, an excess of privation. So there are limit conditions, but um, the, it, it's a leftist trope that the provision of additional material resources will produce ethically superior human beings. Sorry, not true. And in fact, sometimes quite the contrary. So, so, um, so I, don't, I, don't, I don't buy that argument in the least. Um, I also think that under most circumstances, excepting those of exceptional privation, and even perhaps under those conditions, in most, in most cases, your best bet to move people forward is to concentrate on the development of their individual character and their individual, their individual moral character. And because moral character is actually, your moral character is actually the set of tools that you have to operate effectively in the world. Because otherwise morality would be of no utility. And morality is in some sense precisely that which, which is of maximal utility. And so, and, and the other objection that I would throw out at the radical left is, well, how do you know that your, oh, your emphasis on collective 
uh, existence isn't just an abdication of your personal responsibility. Well, of course it's not. It's like, no, 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 seriously here. It's not that easy to adopt personal responsibility, maximal personal responsibility. What makes you think you're not running away from it? You have every reason to. You're really of that stellar moral character. Really, that's, that's your self-analysis. It's like, sorry, I don't buy it. And I especially don't buy it when I look at the consequences of leftist revolutions. Because all these people of stellar moral character, when they undertake their collectivist revolution, nothing comes out of that but absolute bloody catastrophe. So, so all the well-meaning aims aside. Obviously he takes the sort of frame of the individual being paramount and the collective being secondary, which I think is, is ultimately right, and he has no apology of that, obviously. Mm. Um, but this sense that there are certain structural things that make it more, more difficult to live a good life. I mean, that seems kind of undeniable that mm. certain situations are more conducive to flourishing than others. But then if you expand that to a sort of more developmental lens, which says, okay, the, the top of the pyramid is self-actualization. The top of the pyramid is be, becoming truly ourselves and developing ourselves, our moral character and, and becoming kind of fully embodied mm -hmm. human beings. I, I asked him, well, surely there are situations where it's more e easy to do that than others, which is an argument I've heard lots of people make in mm -hmm. the sort of more progressive circles that I'm familiar with. And he pushed back on that in a way I'd never really heard before, and that was to say that the idea of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, so you get your sort of basic needs met at the top of the pyramid of self-actualization, he doesn't like very much because implicit in that is the idea that rich people must be more moral than poor people. And I'd never heard it framed that, 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 that way, and I think there's something in that. I think there's something quite profound in that, this equation of more material goods will produce ethically better people. And that's such a, hel a strongly held thing on the left. Mm. And it's such a key point to, um, to kind of pull apart that sort of implicit. And I think it's not held explicitly, I think it's held implicitly by a lot of people on the left. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that was one of the key moments in that interview for me. Uh, that, that I'd also just never thought of it in those terms at all. And it makes me think just, if, it makes me think of Brexit as well. It makes me think of a lot of the tensions that are in the society where there is this kind of assumed, there is actually in many parts of, especially the cosmopolitan city dwelling um, li kind of liberal, uh, of which I'm probably one to be honest. <laughs> um, there is an assumption that all these idiots out in the countryside are just, you know, like Hillary Clinton said, deplorables. And you know, what do they know? They're, they're all racist idiots. There's a complete lack of respect and lack of attempt at any empathy. Um, and so there is a dissonance within the left around that that I really think needs to be, I think I said this right after Brexit as well, like on a Facebook post, I was like, we all who consider ourselves progressive need to um, be progressive and be empathetic and go and connect and really get to know. Um, I mean, yeah, that's, that's absolutely key and it never really happened. Yeah. It still hasn't, maybe it will. But. Yeah. yeah, this is the, I mean, our regular viewers might get bored with the number of times I say this, but it's the shadow of liberalism. Yeah. It's this idea of this inclusivity that actually hides a tribalism. Yeah. And pretty much everyone on the other side of that debate recognizes it as a tribalism. They feel excluded, they feel rejected, they mm. feel judged by liberals, for yeah. want of a better word. And the idea, this is why I think this is such a crucial conversation to be had about how does the left go about policing its boundaries and go about healing itself. Because the left is so dysfunctional right now and is so, in, is so rejecting so clearly the people it claims to care about. Yeah. Like the idea that it loves, it loves the poor in, in abstract but hates everything that they believe. Hates patriotism, hates all of the things that give people meaning yeah. and groundedness and all of this stuff. And that's, that to me is the most terrifying thing of what's happened since the election of Trump and since Brexit is that a lot of the liberal... Um, classes that I know are doubling down on what I think caused that rejection in the first place. Yeah. Saying, oh my God, it's worse than we thought. They're so much more racist and bigoted and everything's so much worse than we thought. It's like, well, perhaps a little bit less of that rejection yeah. of all the people who voted for 
for Trump and Brexit, maybe a little bit of kind of self-reflection and understanding that, okay, Hillary Clinton and the left, you managed to lose to Donald Trump. <laughs> Yeah. That, that's pretty bad. Yeah. And that's what was really interesting about the debate with the guys at CIIS. They really were on board with that question. Yeah. They, they kind of, Matthew raised that as a, like, we need to look at ourselves. We managed to lose to Donald Trump. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, with the, absolutely. Um, just, just finally on that point, you know, as, as we're talking about it, I'm just thinking my own personal experience, linked back to what Peterson says about moral virtue. Um, and it's absolutely true. You know, when I meet someone, it's not their beliefs that uh, rank them in, in my mind of how good a person are they or how, how trustworthy are they and how authentic are they. It's, it's empathy. Empathy is the, it's also the driving force in a lot of in like this, you know, integral studies, developmental models. Um, it, empathy is what's needed to be able to say yes and, to transcend and include. And empathy is what is lacking in a lot of spheres on the left, not everywhere, but in a lot of it, like as you were saying. Um, and. I think it's spread out fairly evenly, just based purely on my own experience, I think it's spread out fairly evenly through class. Um, and I think Peterson is probably right about that in the sense that Maslow's hierarchy of needs is not the thing that gets you to that kind of self-actualization. It's, there's something else going on. Yeah. yeah, and that as well. I mean, I grew up within a, uh, a left, very leftist household. And I know this in myself up until uh, kind of yeah, a, a while after I left home, this sense of, like I know the leftist mindset really well, we, I, I don't know whether I'm on the left anymore, so I won't say we, but on the left, people tend to judge each other by views. Mm. Like very willing to sort of, well, I don't know if I can like this person because they think this or they think this. Mm. Whereas I know, I'm not sure that the same thing happens quite as much on the right. I think on the right, people are far more willing to judge people by the contents of their character and by their, their individual, yeah, by their moral character. Whereas on the left, there are certain views that people are sort of testing out. And if you are accused of holding those, then you'll be on the pale. And that's, and I see this also, like e even in friends that I, that I have since we started putting out some content about Jordan Peterson, there's a kind of, well, I'm not sure whether I, whether I approve of that. I'm not sure whether I like you anymore. I'm not sure whether, like how to behave around you. Yeah. And that, that really, that's a, that's a big thing on the left that I'm, I'm not sure is the same on the right. Yeah, I think from on the right, there is a, a great respect for individual sovereignty, whereas the left has a great respect for collective fairness. Um, and obviously they overlap in some ways, but that respect for individual sovereignty also, I think, has an impact on it. It's like, well, you think this, but that's, that's your business. And I'll stay out of my way, you stay out of, you know, we'll, we'll help each other if we need to, but you know, and th there's, there's pitfalls to that as well. But I think, yeah, just thinking out loud, I wonder if some of it comes from that, the, the kind of focus on that, on the individual. In that regard. Yeah, talking about sort of where the left has got blind spots and where the right has got blind spots, I think it's a good time to introduce the integral uh, piece because we, We've talked about integral theory quite a lot. Um, it's Ken Wilber's spiral dynamics model and the idea of a developmental society that goes through certain um, defined stages as they go towards sort of more integral. Integral itself is like post ideology. It's a space of, there's an ideology at each, at each level and integral is able to kind of, like it's a flexibility of mind that's able to see where each of the, the different stages gets stuck and to move beyond it. So yeah, one of the big conversations in the integral community has been whether Jordan, like there's been this huge kind of um, difficulty of digesting Jordan Peterson in lots of the integral communities that I'm aware of. Is he an integral thinker? Is he not an integral thinker? He seems to incorporate so much into his worldview, but is he a genuinely integral thinker? So we, we had a great conversation with Jeff Solzman of the Daily Evolver where we asked him, put him on the spot and said, is Jordan Peterson an integral thinker? And this is what he said. Would you say from your perspective, he is an integral thinker? Yes, I would. He is able to th definitely think integrally. He has integral cognition, as we would say. Uh, his, um, his heart, in a way, is in traditionalism, in my opinion, uh, in a way that I think keeps him a little stuck there, honestly. Uh, but I don't care, because what he's doing is he is helping this whole strata of people who have never had traditionalism well installed. I think he's right. I think, for me, 
Peterson is talking about the value of listening to, to people from different political backgrounds, the value of exchanging ideas, this is an integral viewpoint of being able to say, well, this is what this person believes, this is what this person believes, this is why, this is why. Like there's a, he, he's able to sketch that out, but I also agree that there's some, probably some kind of reactivity in the way that he is towards the left that shows that he's not fully integral in the way that he's in the world. But then I think, who is? Like I, 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 don't, I don't know anyone who I would say is integral all the way down. Yeah, and Matt uh, at CIIS, um, Matt Siegel made a really good point where he said, we move between the different levels. He's like, not integral all day long. You know, he's like, you can be, to, to use a little bit of the integral jargon, but you could be green and you could have a red reaction or an amber kind of thing. So it is a constantly flowing thing. I think Salzman put it really beautifully with that um, kind of modernist heart and integral head. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that as well. Like he says, it doesn't matter. So there is a place where I think that there's an implicit value in a lot of what Peterson is saying that I haven't really heard him make explicit before. And this was my, this is our final clip from the Jordan Peterson interview. In a sense, what he is arguing for is the reintegration of the sacred. And that's what I really, that's what I really value about what he's saying. And so if that's the case, and that materialism as a doctrine is a really, um, it deadens the world. Seeing ourselves as merely material parts that are sort of, we happen to be conscious but we don't understand why, is, is obviously deeply kind of uh, opposed to the religious sense of no, there is a deeper meaning, we are here for a reason, we are in some sense the universe revealing itself to itself and all of this, the different ways that we have of understanding our place. Mm. Uh, and that somehow we are reflecting the universe in our, in our being, all of these deep theological ideas. Implicit in his arguments is the sense that this is a spiritual crisis. Mm. This is, you, and we look at, for example, the opioid crisis in America and the, the dying off of the white working class in America. To me, this is the evidence of a real spiritual void. This is a real sense of the, the, the negative effects of capitalism, which commodify everything, turn everything into a monetary value. And most of the, the, the people that I know on, in more progressive circles are not materialists. They're much more spiritually inspired and they're much more open to that. It's a sort of Russell Brand's message of what we're seeing is actually a reflection of a deeper spiritual crisis. I think that's absolutely true. And I also think that's implicit in a lot of what Jordan Peterson is saying but he doesn't make it explicit so much because I think he's also got a lot of, um, it's also true when he defends the system w that we have as the best system that we've ever created. In terms of material wealth, it's by far the best system we've ever created. And if you start critiquing the system without saying, and wow, look at, look at the, the value in the technology and the way that mm. more people than ever before have been lifted out of poverty and more people have access to clean water and more, all of these things are, are true at the same time. So I thought, there is a way that he could reframe his message that I think would connect with a lot of the people who are currently rejecting it. Mm. And this was the, the final clip we're gonna play. My, my sense of a lot of the progressive people that I know is that they're not, they're sort of from a new generation, they're not generally materialist. They're, they're sort of very spiritually aware. And I, I sense a kind of implicit message in what you're saying that I've, I've never heard made explicitly that in some sense, materialism is a deadening doctrine. I mean, you look at the opioid crisis in America, you look at a lot of these, if, if poverty is seen as a more sort of, also, also as a sort of spiritual crisis or a, a crisis of the soul as much as anything else. It's, it, it's mostly that. It, like, it, it, it's it, a, it'd be a lovely yeah. thing if, if poverty was caused by lack of money. Mm. We could fix it really easily then, but it but isn't. I, my, my point, I think, is to say that if, if you were framing your message in that way, I think there would be a lot of people on the left who'd be receptive to that message. Sort of that, that actually there is a crisis of, that the crisis of, um, what would you call it, like worldview has real consequences. And a lot of the poverty we're seeing in the world is to do with this kind of materialist worldview that has become, become um, corrupt or at least kind of stripped all of the meaning and purpose out yeah, of the world. That, that, that's a good point. Well, right. Well, I mean, I don't believe that materialism, materialist hedonism is a sufficient solution. Now, it's a bit more complicated than that because I do think that functional democratic systems are actually pretty good at reasonable hedonism. 
Like I'm pretty happy that our system produces a variety of toothpastes and a variety of toilet papers and a variety of sanitary napkins, all of these things that, that are basically oriented towards what would you call them individual creature comforts. There's something about that that's really merciful and properly egalitarian. And so a certain degree of material hedonism is a good thing, right? Because it, it's nice that people can have their basic needs taken care of in a dignified manner. Um, but as a, as a ultimate solution to the problems of life, it's insufficient, which is again why I don't really like Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of, 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 of needs. You know, it isn't, it isn't a progression up the moral chain because of the provision of additional material resources. It doesn't work that way. That doesn't mean that you don't wanna, you wanna set up a situation where as many people as possible are absent the terrible strictures of, of privation. But we are doing that quite rapidly, thank God. So, so I think where the leftists are less happy with what I'm doing is the case that I'm making that the meaning that transcends mere materialism is to be found in the adoption of individual responsibility. Because I wouldn't say that that's a core message, certainly not of the radical left. It's, it's not that at all, because generally they construe the individual as either the oppressor or the suffering oppressed, but not as the active agent, uh, as either of those active agents. The problem with the oppressor op oppress narrative is even though there's an element of truth to it, each of us can be subdivided into so many group identities that there's at least one dimension along which we're all oppressors. And that's actually, when, when I've been looking at what happened in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution. That, that was the bloody error, so to speak. Because you could take virtually every, any individual and you could find out, it's like if there's one dimension of your identity that makes you an oppressor, that trumps all the elements of your identity where you're a victim. And the problem with that is there is one element of your identity where you're an oppressor. And so that's sufficient justification to throw you in with the predators and do whatever is necessary to dispense with you. And that is exactly what happened in the aftermath, well, not only of the Russian Revolution, but all of these radical leftist revolutions. It's like, well, if you're a socialist, well, you're not sufficiently pure from a doctrinaire perspective. And if you're a student, well, then you're part of the emerging bourgeois class. And if your parents were reasonably, um, what would you say, efficient farmers, then you're part of the kulaks. And, like, it just went on and on and on and on. There wasn't anybody who escaped from, the, from being tarred with the brush of oppressor. And that's because, that is because each of us are in fact oppressors and oppressed. Every single person shares both of those things in common. So the other question are, where are his blind spots? So I spoke to Lena Anderson, who's an author and also deeply involved in this question about what does a developmental society look like? Um, and she said something that I, that I've, we, we kind of touched on this in our podcast where we did a sort of constructive critique of Jordan Peterson, which is, is there a, a kind of theological incompleteness? Mm. Like he, he's bringing back, he's speaking to the sort of masculine power of the, the culture in a, in a real way, saying these, there are these sort of very valuable hierarchies of competence, there is a, a great story of responsibility going back generations. Her, her thought was that he, he stops with the kind of Judeo-Christian Abrahamic tradition and doesn't go further to the sort of the mother cults and the, the, the yeah. sort of things that sustained us when we were in uh, hunter-gatherer societies. Mm -hmm. um, I've, got a, I've got some sympathy with, with that and I'd love to ask him about it because this sense that and this is, I think, where his idea of archetypes as timeless things, that's where I start to diverge, I think, because if they're not timeless, if they've evolved, then potentially what we are experiencing at the moment is a shift in these archetypal patterns. Because we're moving from the archetypal pattern of, for example, um, male and female roles mm. based on the history of agriculture, the history of... Um, the value that males' greater physical strength put on them as protectors and, and all of this to, some, to a time when that's less important. 
So is there, a, is there an archetypal shift going on? And before that, there was Hunter Gather Stone Age. So John B. Peterson completely misses the animism of the Hunter Gatherers and the Mother Earth uh, goddess of the early farmers. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, another way to look at that question is so he is talking about I, I agree with with that reading, you know, because especially with a very psychedelic background, um, inquiring into the nature of like the divine feminine and what place that has in society and the history of it and, you know, how it's been present in many cultures like Minoan Crete, etc. I mean, it's a whole huge topic that is um, I think that's a really core th important point. What Peterson is bringing to it, so is this revival of, you could say the revival of the divine masculine archetype um, in a lot of ways. So the question is, I think both need to be revived personally, archetypally, you need the divine masculine and you need the divine feminine. Because right now we, we kind of, you have the devouring mother and you have the kind of, I mean, a lot of, not in their full power male archetypes as well so which has to, it's something like it has to happen at the same time he's bringing one piece of it but i think it's a fair critique to say to at least get him to contextualize that to say you know to, to inquire into that question are the archetypes changing does that need to does it need to be happen at the same time or for some reason does there need to be a revival of the divine masculine archetype and then the divine feminine archetype afterwards or whatever it might be open question i think it's a good one there so yeah this is a trial we've just overloaded people with content um putting up six things at the same time seeing how it goes i mean it's the idea is to try and start a conversation the idea is to try and build a community and the idea is to try and create a space where we can have these conversations um in a way that they become generative, they become open, they become constructive, rather than getting dragged into the polarization that we see in an awful lot of the, especially in the social media space. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, it's really key focus in Rebel Wisdom right now is how do we, yeah, have a two-way conversation, a generative conversation where everyone's adding to it and we collectively, all of us, get to new places and, you know, explore new different thoughts. There's only two of us, there's 22,000, I think, other people. So we've created a, um, a Discord. Uh, so the link to the Discord will be under the, in the show notes. Obviously, the, the conversations in the comments are really valuable as well. Can you explain what a Discord is to people who may not know? Uh, it's just a Discord. Um, a Discord is a chat program. It's a kind of chat platform. It's really easy to use. Um, if you click the link, um, it'll take you through to kind of setting up an account. And, and the reason we've done that taking it onto a different platform is so that we can have specific moderated conversations. Um, people who are really engaged can become moderators. We can split out different um, types of chat. There can be a general chat. There can be a Jordan Peterson left chat, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, but I think it's, it's important to um, have it somewhere outside in its own space so it can become a community um, in its own right as well. Great. And yeah, get involved go onto the Discord, leave your comments. And if you enjoy the content that we're putting out, please do consider sponsoring us on Patreon. Uh, we'll also put the link below this in the show notes. So thank you very much. Thanks.